What's up, Kate? How are you doing today? I am better than I deserve. Drew Boy, how are you? I'm doing great, man. I, I like that. Better than you deserve. I like that. I like that a lot. You saying. know, it's funny because Dave Ramsey says that on his radio oh, really? show. Yeah. And I was when I was at church yesterday, I was playing on the band and in the morning I went and asked the our electric guitarist. I was like, how you doing, Joe? And he's like, better than I deserve. And I said, you listen to Dave Ramsey? He's all, yes, sir, I do. And I'm like, <laughs> I, and I've always liked when Dave said that because it's true. It's better than I deserve. How are you? Love that. I, I'm the same way. Better than I deserve. And I it's funny. So there's someone in my office who, whenever you ask him, he says better than you. And, uh, and I think that that's always a funny thing to say to you. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. But, but yeah, dude, I, uh, had a great weekend. I actually completely revamped, looked over, just had like a, a real deep dive into myself and who I am and my being, which is what I'll be talking about later, but it was a very productive weekend and, and nice to, to kind of look at things, over the past year and analyze for the future. So how about you, man? Did you have any fun things that you happened this weekend? Yeah, I got, um, let's see. I had church, um, got to see some, um, investor clients of mine, um, got to go to winter Haven, watch some good football, hang out with the family. So yeah, it was a, it was a very, very good weekend for sure. So amazing. Um, yeah. Excited to, finish out, you know, the, re you know, the few weeks that we have left here. And I know this week is NGRN week. So we're stoked for that. We're going to have DP uh, this Friday, mm -hmm. December 15th from 530 to 830 at the Sands Club. Um, I was at an event last week and, you know, met some really cool people and got to invite them out. So hopefully, you know, um, they're, they were excited about it and wanted to come. So they'll most likely be coming. And it's just cool to have a meetup where, you know, or really a resource that you can just invite your, you know, friends and sphere, sphere of influence too. So I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be our last one of the year, right? Absolutely. We're going to end it out with a bang. And I'm, you know, it's, it blows my mind that we've been doing this now for two years. It's crazy. Like, I cannot believe that this is our full year too. And, uh, but I'm really looking forward to the end and next year, it's going to be better than this year and the year before. And hopefully the year after that's better than that. But yeah. I totally agree. You know, when you when you share that with other people, they feel like it's very special. Uh, and who knows? I mean, you might accidentally make a connection with someone for somebody that could change their life. And so, you know, having that network as a place to to kind of go and and meet new people is is unique and very uh, very rewarding from your and I perspective, right? Being able yeah. to we we put that together. So for yeah. sure, awesome, uh, dude. Why don't you jump in the network or in the, uh, into your market and share with us what you got? Yeah, so I'm going to go over Tucson um, as we finish out the year. Um, as you may or may not know, I kind of look at different markets every week, but it's all in Southern Arizona. Um, so as far as November 2023, uh, we had a average sales price in Tucson of $335,000. Uh, that stayed consistent from October and was up about five grand from September. So we kind of seen an increase all year um, in, in the Tucson market. Uh, as far as closed sales, uh, we saw uh, a decline. Um, we are back, wow, that's crazy. I mean, as far as closed sales in Tucson, we are back to like 2000 and mid 2011 numbers as far as the velocity. So we are, as far as like a 10 year timeline, we are extremely down in the amount of units that are selling. So um, that would just basically tell me as a consumer and a realtor that there's not a lot of inventory. There's not a lot of home selling right now. Um, days on market, uh, we saw uh, stayed consistent at 15 days since July. So since July of this year, it's been a consistent 15 days on market. It's been our average. And then month supply, we've also been at a consistent 1.9 um, since July as well. Um, so 1.9 months is how long it would take for all the current inventory to sell out if no other inventory came on the market. That tells me that we're in a really good seller's market still. 
Um, you know, obviously every home is going to be subjective to the amount of days it's been on market, but for the vast majority of homes, you know, we're still in a really good seller's market at some of the lowest points over the past 10 years, 13 years. So, um, yeah, I mean, overall still a super, super strong market as we head into 2024. What I would say is there is a lot of, there's still a lot of liquidity, you know, when people look back. Uh, you know, at 2010, they get nervous because they think we're headed for another major real estate crash. Um, as I just pointed out, you know, for the city of Tucson anyway, uh, there's just not enough inventory for that to be the case one. And then there's still uh, so many lending regulations that we just did not have in place back in 2010. So you can't just go get a loan. You have to have the you know, income and the tax returns and the employment to actually qualify. You can't just state your income and get a freaking loan, which is insane to me that that was ever the case. Um, and so because of that, as we head into 2024, we're going to see a lot of, uh, you know, the Lighthouse program is in talks, right, of getting refunded. You have a lot of lenders getting creative in regards to how they can, you know, get affordable financing to a lot of home buyers out there. And then on top of that, the Fed is planning, from what they say, six uh, uh, rate cuts next year. Um, so all that considered, with the low supply that we have overall, when I look at a 10-year period, I just don't see the real estate market slowing really at all, especially as we head in, you know, as we finish out January, February, March and start heading into those summer months. Um, it'll be, you know, I think it'll stay a pretty hot market. So that's all I have. What do you got, Drew? I love that. Well, actually, one question that I have for you, and I don't know if you're going to know the answer to this off the top of your head. So give it your best shot. But I've seen recently that people are worried that the multifamily space, that market could potentially get hit on or receive some hits. Reason being, I've seen that um, people bought in at super high prices and they bought in at deals that didn't pencil, which obviously 101, make sure every deal pencils, but they were hopeful that the appreciation of the real estate market and the momentum would push it so the deal did pencil. Do you see that as a potential red flag in the multifamily space, not necessarily market wide, but just specifically in the multifamily sector? 100%. Yeah, I think end of 2024, you will see a lot of bigger multifamily uh, uh, spaces um, getting foreclosed on or really in a lot of trouble because what happens is back in 2020, 2021, you had these people, you know, syndicating these deals together, basically, which just means they're pooling a bunch of other people's money together to buy the asset. And they're banking on the fact that the real estate will appreciate like it was doing in 2019, 2020, and 2021, um, that they could then successfully pull off a refinance when their balloon payment is due. Well, a lot of those balloon payments, because these properties were bought 2020, 2021 are going to be due end of 2024. So a lot of them are three year to five year balloons, five year notes. So you're going to see a lot of those coming due. I think a lot of them will be in trouble because now the rates are, you know, even if they go down next year, right, they're still going to be double what they got into come 2021 um, or 2020. And so, yeah, I think that a lot of the bigger multifamily stuff will definitely be in trouble. Um, so I think it's, you know, those properties have a good chance of, you know, exchanging hands. Um, and I already see it. I mean, I talked to a lot of owners and, and brokers in that space, and you already were seeing that with some properties, just the owners are in trouble and, you know, they're going to, they're going to have to sell out a loss or go bankrupt, or I don't know what's going to happen to them, but, uh, what that will create is buying opportunities for people who are underwriting well, who have access to long-term debt structures, um, cash buyers, stuff like that, where the deal can now pencil out for them and, uh, you know, it will make sense. So overall, yes, I do think we'll see uh, a lot. And um, I mean, you could just see it, dude, just driving up to Marana, Oro Valley, you go out to Phoenix, all you see getting built is multifamily. I mean, it's insane. So overall, uh, yeah, I think we'll see some of that. I think there'll be opportunities, you know, next year for sure for buildings like that. Um, 
And so, yeah, if that's something that interests you, feel free to reach out to me, come to the meetup. We have a lot of commercial guys there. We could get you hooked up with and actually come to the meetup this week because Derek who will be speaking um, has a lot of experience with commercial and he probably has a better understanding of what the opportunities come 2024 will be. Absolutely. And I agree with <clears throat> everything you just said, as well as Kate is the guy for multifamily when it comes to Tucson and understanding. I mean, I don't know anyone that knows more multifamily owners than Kate does. So if you've got questions about getting into that space, Kate is definitely the guy to go to. Um, Thanks, of course, of course. But jumping in now to what I got, I'm not going to cover the indexes that I typically follow because I have a lot to go on today. So I'm just going to talk more general macroeconomics. Um, when you're looking at the economy going into next year, we had mentioned last video, and then you brought it up again today, uh, perfect segue, uh, that the Fed could potentially cut interest rates down six times. Usually those rate cuts are in the form of 0.25 or quarter points. Um, 0.25%. So if they did six effectively at their traditional, you know, markings that they do, we drop about a percent and a half on the federal funds rate, which <clears throat> is good and bad. So the good thing about it is, is when it gets to that point, inflation usually is significantly lower, or we're seeing a decrease in inflation, which we are, as well as it's showing that CPI numbers and just the ability to spend money, the average consumer is struggling. And so what this means is that usually when they're lowering it, it's signifying, hey, we're not able to spend money because either things are too expensive or it doesn't make us sense for us to borrow because it makes more sense for us to store our money in short term assets like bonds because bonds pay out super well. And so what you'll see is in this specific scenario, and this is not the same all the time, they do work inversely in, and uh, in a bunch of different ways, but since the way that the bond market happened in 2022, we saw both the S&P 500 and the bond market significantly decline in value. The bond market's still on sale. And so what that means is people are going to be wanting to get into the bond market because it's at a discounted price. And they're going to be wanting to get in the bond markets that are longer term in nature because longer term duration bonds tend to hold a little bit closer to the federal fund rate in terms of uh, coupons. So let me explain this in more layman's terms. When the federal funds rate or the, the, the Fed makes the interest rate a certain percentage, the longer the bond is, the closer to the legitimate percentage that's going to sit. The shorter the bond, typically the higher the, the earning or the percent is going to be. And so since we're going to be seeing a declining market, we're going to want to get into the longer term bonds because they're still going to be higher than what the declining market's going to be. And they're going to be long term. So you're going to get those same earnings over time, which as the mass exodus of people leave the short rate, short duration bonds and enter the long duration bonds, you're going to see an appreciation, which is again, kind of reflecting what we saw as a downfall in COVID. So all of that to say, and that was a super long winded response to say, Right now, shifting from short-term bonds to long-term bonds in the economy, if this rate if these rate cuts actually happen, uh, is going to be the move. And we are predicting that potentially. And of course, I'm this is not financial advice. I don't have a crystal ball, but from my from my views and my eyes, I can see that the equities market might be a little shaky and a little wobbly, and it might not be as strong. So. Tread with caution and don't exactly take what I say, but if you have questions about your specific situation, always consult a financial professional like myself. Um, we can sort of, sort of help guide you through the questions and concerns that you might have. Now, going into what my call to action is, is really just getting a basic understanding of your numbers. So I had the conversation over the weekend with uh, Andres, who's one of our major members, I'd say. He goes to all of the events. He's very active. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, we've been talking and and he's very motivational. He's very good at like being hard on you and he will call you out and he'll say, you aren't doing this. You aren't doing that. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. 
but he means really well and it's not hurtful. It's constructive and it really helps. And so him and I had a conversation on Friday just about like going into 2024 and what does our situations look like? And, you know, what, what is he wanting? And, uh, and he was like, you need to really, really dig into your numbers and just figure out what it is that you do. And so I dug into my numbers and I'm going to go ahead and share that with you guys. But I think it's super important to, to really have that understanding of what it is that you're driving for, right? What's your driving force? What are you trying to do in your business and in your life? And are you putting everything that you possibly can into that to make sure that you hit those goals? And so, you know, to briefly just dive in, uh, this 2023, it was my first year as a commission-based advisor. So I was completely on my own, making money, had to set appointments. And so I was, I'm not, wouldn't say I was new, but I was definitely like easing into it. And so um, my conversion percentage wasn't great. I set 87 first client appointments this year uh, and I converted 30 of them. And then I took notes of everything that generated my clients. So who were my, per, who came in that was personal? Who, whoa, what if my clients were sphere referrals? How many did I get from Lunch and Learns? How many did I get from the different organizations that I'm a part of? And then who were my top referring spheres? And then you go down to the at bats. How many times did I get the opportunity to have conversations? And of course, who, how did I get those? Did I get those from my personal self, my spheres, lunch and learns, different networking organizations, and who gave me the opportunity to get that many at bats? Thank you so much, Cade. You are number two there and actually tied with number one, but, but yeah, who gave me the oh. most opportunities for the at bats? And then of course, and I, this was one of the key takeaways that he shared with me was you cannot have your logical goals without having the emotion behind it. So why are you saying the goals that you want to set? What are they? And why are you setting them? What's the purpose? And it can't be just like, oh, I want to make a lot of money. It's, oh, I want to make a lot of money because why? You want to make sure your family's taken care of. You want to make sure that you're able to be generous, whatever it looks like for you. And so then I really dove down and I said, okay, based on my commission earnings, what is the likelihood that I'll make $100,000? And so I calculated it based upon how many, how much I earn on my average life case, how much my average investment client has, how much my average annuity client has. And then I said, okay, if I sold only products within those three categories, how many I would need to sell to get 100K? So I'd have to sell 303 life cases or 5.84 life cases a week to make 100K at this average life commission. I have to sell $3.3 million worth of annuities or bring in $3.3 million worth of annuity assets to hit hundred grand, or I'd have to bring in $33 million of investment assets to do it. And then I looked at a reflection of my actual book. So what do I actually doing? And it looks this way. So I'm very investment heavy and I do life and annuity business, but it's really investment heavy. And so then in theory, breaking up the proportions of that how much I would need to bring in in each category to hit my goals. So I add up all three of those together and then you realize, okay, now I know how much I need to bring in. Now we figure out how, what does that reverse engineer into in your day-to-day -day atmosphere, right? Because I can figure that out and say, okay, I need to bring in that amount of money, but is that really going to get me where I want to go? And so I look at the fact that I had 87 total attempts, 57 of them I missed, which isn't actually an accurate response. I'm still working on 27 cases. They're still open. I'm just working with, that's just not the right time. So really this number is substantially higher. I'm probably at more like 57 and 30, um, but so flipped, but anyways, so you're looking at a 34% closing percentage as of what I have today right now. And they say, okay, at a 34% closing percentage, how many insurance clients do I need to sit with at this closing percentage to hit 70 life cases for the year? And that's about 3.94 new appointments. For investments, how many new appointments do I need to sit on to allow myself to bring in that much money? 30 appointments every single week with an average of 42. And so you do all of the math and you break it down. And basically what it comes down to is not humanly possible for me to make a hundred grand at the same case or at what if I treat my business the exact same way that I treated it before, because I would have to effectively work 170 hours 
by the, by the amount of calls I need to make per day at 72, plus the amount of appointments I need to have per week, which is 68 to hit those goals based on the previous metrics. And there's only 168 hours in a week. So it's not possible. So you have to look at yourself and you say, okay, so knowing that that's not possible and that I can't hit those goals, what needs to change in my business to be able to hit those goals? Because clearly I was doing some things right, but I was also not doing some things right. And so then you make adjustments that way and you say, okay, I need to do this better, this better, this better. But this goes to say, reflect on what you've done, figure out what works and where you're spending your time at and make sure that it's worth it and know your numbers like the back of your hand. Because I didn't know my numbers because I had no numbers to go off of, but I looked at it this year and I said, dang, what I thought was working well, lunch and learns. I did 16 and I only actually converted two clients from it. Is it really worth my time? I mean, in a way, yes, because it's marketing and it gets my head out there. But in reality, when you're looking at the business, you know, profit line, like I thought I was converting way more clients from Lunch and Learns and I wasn't. I just, I didn't know. And so, because they feel good. So all that to say, you know, know your numbers, really figure out where you're spending your time and make adjustments because, you only get to be the year of the age that you are right now. I only get to be 24 once. And that 24 is almost over. And I turn 25 in February. And then I only get to be 25 once and then 26 once. And, you know, and, and that's it. And so making sure that you are living your best life, but really prioritizing your business and your goals. So that way you hit it. And the only way to do that is by knowing your numbers. Dude, that's a huge takeaway. I appreciate it. I- I think um, I think that's amazing, first and foremost, that you took the time to figure all that out. What is What are some actionable steps you feel like you'll take into next year, knowing like maybe the lunch and learns don't work? Like how, because there's got to be, you know, a thought process behind everything you did to where now you're looking at 2024 and thinking, this is how I'm going to spend my time. Could you elaborate maybe on that? Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I viewed last year, which is part of the business, right? You have to get your head out there. You have to meet as many people as you possibly can, right? And so some key takeaways that I'm going to have is what is one way to get your face out there and meet as many people as you possibly can without being reliant on being in multiple places at the same time? Social media. So social media needs to be a primary aspect of my business and prioritizing that because I can't be seven places at the same time, but a hundred million people could be on Instagram looking at my picture at the same time. So that's the number one. Number two is I need to coach my spheres, which it's always okay to do this, but coach your spheres and ask them, say, Hey, look, you know, I appreciate what you've sent me. I appreciate the referrals that you've given to me. However, You know, I'm really trying to make some movements around, this is what I'm looking for. Can you keep your eyes out for more specific rather than throwing a dart at a dartboard and saying, hope it hits, give these guidelines of the type of person that you're looking for, because the more specific you are, the more names that come to your spheres heads. Uh, And then number three is really leveling up my target audience, right? I think I focused a lot on the wrong type of people, not necessarily saying that they are bad. But I think my my energy and time was spent on maybe people who aren't the best for my type of business because of for a multitude and plethora of different reasons. Yeah. And so I think that those are the, my three big key takeaways for next year. And just positioning myself to be in more favorable conversations with better qualified clients. So mm. yeah. yeah. And what what is like, if you can share and maybe you can't, but what is maybe one of the metrics that quantifies someone or qualifies someone as being, you know, more quality client or a client worth your time versus someone who's not? Absolutely. I mean, I think the biggest metric is their willingness and wantingness to do it, right? Like I will always say this for my eternity of life, right? If someone is willing and able to, and they want to, it doesn't matter if they're going to invest $50 a month or $100 a month. If they put in the effort to get me all the documents on time and they're constantly setting their appointments, they're answering their phones, they're being a good client, I will always respect that and take that on. You know, some metric that I might be looking for more of is, 
is I think I went after a lot of single individuals and uh, just, I mean, being completely transparent, I work at an insurance company and I'm very investment minded. And so investments don't pay quite as well as something like a life insurance. And so, you know, maybe positioning myself in front of young families who need life insurance, granted, I'm not going to force a transaction or force a sale, but if it makes sense and they need it, you know, positioning your target market at that kind of like going, you know, you wouldn't sell ice to an Eskimo or you wouldn't sell, you know, Subway sandwiches to uh, Jimmy John's, right? You're, you're, you know, your target audience. And so go after what is it you're looking for? And those are probably two intangible metrics that I would say I would look after because there is no dollar amount. I don't, I do not say, Oh, I'm not willing to work with you if you don't have, you know, $10,000 $10,000. I don't have no minimum. I don't have any minimums. So. Right. Right. Well, that's good to know. I mean, cause now, you know, strategically how to market, you know, strategically who you need to talk to, you know, str- you know, it, it's so important, I think. And I think, you know, everyone like you, you've done it and I'm sure you do it. And we're getting together on Thursday to talk about it, but like, you know, we all kind of, start with the most wide approaches we can. And over time, we slowly start to position ourselves and, and more tunnel vision ourselves into the correct correct group based upon what works for us. And yeah. so I think, you know, that's the thing is like, I definitely look at last year as a, or this past year as a learning experience and I didn't hit the goals that I wanted to, but, you know, I think that I did, I I tested the waters and was able to say, okay, this didn't work, but this did. And I think when you're, when you are looking at it, it's very easy and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's easy to just beat yourself up and say, holy crap, I did nothing. I didn't do anything. And in reality, you really worked your butt off. I mean, I feel like I worked my butt off and it didn't show, but that was because I didn't know what exactly I was doing. And so you're in your first year, your second year, and you're facing the same sort of struggles. This is where you tweak. This is the time. And you're not alone. I mean, you talk to, you know, you talk to guys who are 10 times past where you are and they're still adjusting and figuring things out. And so it's funny. I was talking to kind of a mentor I would consider of mine uh, who's super successful in the real estate industry. And he told me when he first started, he didn't figure out really what he wanted to do, really what he wanted to niche down in until, you know, I think it was like 10 years later. And so you just really don't know where the career opportunities can take you. And sometimes that means a switch if it makes sense for you at that time in your life. Um, All that to say, just keep an open mind. Don't, don't, you know, Cause there may be some people out there who hate what they're doing right now, but they're just doing it and maybe they're finding success with it. Right. You never know where that could, you know, take you or lead you, or maybe you meet someone who's doing something that, that you really want to do, but you would never have met them had you, you know, done something differently than what you're doing now. And so just stick, stick with it, just, you know, adjust accordingly. But I will say don't head into next year with nothing learned from this year. I mean, if you're going into next year with nothing learned, you're probably doing something wrong. I mean, take a second, sit back, reassess. And, you know, for me, same thing as you, Drew. I know, you know, I know where, you know, a lot of my transactions came from, you know, last year. And I know what I do want to do and what I don't want to do heading into next year. So I know exactly what I need to be doing next year. And now it's just a matter of actually executing it. So um, if you're all finished, Drew, I'll finish with our quote. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for showing us that. That's really cool and uh, a vulnerable place. So thank you. Um, with that said, our quote for this week and for the rest of 2023 is there is no better time than the present. And so, you know, you've probably heard it before. It is a common phrase, but it is so stinking true. I can't tell you how many times, and maybe you feel the same way, Drew. I know we've talked about it before, where I am just living my life. Maybe I'm working, maybe I'm out with family, maybe we're, you know, at Winter Haven or whatever the heck we're doing. And I sit there and I just think to myself, holy crap, I'm just here in this moment, in this span of time with these people in this spot. 
And it just kind of hits me. I mean, in all of time, ever since times existed, I'm in this one moment. That's all I have. I don't have the money in my bank account. I don't have anything else except this moment right now. Mm -hmm. And so when you kind of think about it like that, I mean, the saying is true. There's no better time than the present. So um, we really wanted to use that kind of as a call to action to everyone for this week. You know, get your goals set. Don't wait till January 1st. Do it now. Get your goals set. Do your analysis on your business for 2023. And take that mindset that there's no better time than the present to just figure it out, get the work done and get after it. Because you don't want to be sitting here, you know, December 11th in 2024 and not having improved anything, you know? Absolutely. And I think, you know, the one big last like key takeaway is when you think about it in the grand scheme of things, everyone says, oh, I'm going to wait for my New Year's resolution in January to come. I'm going to wait for this. I'm going to wait for the new year. The new year is nothing but a calendar switch. Literally, you take your old calendar off the wall and you put your new one on. There's nothing different. I don't wake up November, January 1st and say, oh, new year, new me. It doesn't <laughs> happen. It doesn't happen. Yeah. I wake up with the same exact struggles and the same problems I woke up with the year the day before. And so, yeah. you know, it's just don't wait. Don't start it now. If you can start it, I know dang well people are slow at this point. You know, things are people are starting to stay at home and and really spend time with their families and focus on that. So if you can take this time and really plan out your 2024 now, and if it involves routine changes, start it now so you can get that trial run. You know, yeah. like I'm, I'm adjusting my schedule to wake up at 530 every morning. Right. And that's not my end goal, but that's just a starting point. Wake up at 530 every morning. I'm starting now because if I have a few hiccups, it's not the end of the world. But now I'll get on a routine before my routine actually starts come January. So, yeah, that is yeah. amazing. And there's there's no better place to talk with me and Drew about your goal planning or setting your goals than at NGRN this week, the 15th Friday from 530 to 830 at the U of A Sands Club. Again, we'll have Derek Polder uh, from the Polder Group there to uh, talk with us about some of his personal development techniques he's used over his career to really become an ultra success here in Tucson, um, as well as some of the real estate development that he's working on and some of the projects that he's putting together uh, in 2024. Guys, I mean, we bring some heavy hitters to NGRN, I mean, pretty much every week. I mean, if you really had the opportunity to sit down with these people and pick their brain and figure out how successful these guys are, you'd probably be mind blown. So I tell you this from the bottom of my heart, make it out this Friday. Derek is one of the most, he, he's a super down to earth dude. He would love you. You would be honored to meet with this man, pick his brain, learn about his story um, and, and just Every, every time I've met with him or done a class that he's taught, I have learned something that I can actually take away and implement in my business. Like not, not just like a hoorah motivational speech. Like it is actual tangible things that I can pull away from meeting with him and actually implement. And it makes my business so much better. So guys, please make it out Friday. It's going to be our last one of the year. Get together. I'm sure we'll have a good time. And um, because we always do, and we would love to see you there. Absolutely. All right. Well, this is our last video as well for the year. So uh, I will see you next year on this. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, brother. See you later. See you later.